Hi, I'm going to try and show you how to make a frames per second counter with Pygame in the corner of your game's window very briefly. So I've already typed out the code here and I'll just run through it basically just explain what's going on. Um, this stuff with the double hash comment things those are that's code I'm going to uncomment out in the last half of this video to kind of like clean everything up and straighten it up or whatever. So just ignore that completely for now. And then this stuff with a single hash in it is just describing what the block below it does. Okay, so of course going to import sys and I just use that to exit the program when it's done. I use sys.exit, that's why that's imported. And then of course we need pygame. And I just import that as PG, so everywhere you see PG, it's just a shorthand way of referring to the Pygame module or package or whatever. Okay, so then right here, of course, I come in and initialize everything. Normally, I like to initialize display and then each individual little subsystem thing I use individually so that I, you know, maybe it starts a little quicker and there's a little bit less going on in memory or whatever. But just to keep things simple, I just went ahead and did that. And here's the clock, which is about basically averaging and counting the amount of frames and stuff going on later. And then I go ahead and set two constants, black and white, for color. And the reason I do this is because, to me, the constants are a little bit more readable than having to stop and think for a second, like, oh, yeah, 0, 0, 0 means black, or 3, 2, 55 means white, or whatever, if it's even a crazier color. And the other reason is performance, because if you think about it, every time you call that color constructor, you're constructing a brand new object, right? So why not just construct that object once and assign it to a readable variable? So that's what I did for black and white, which I just used for convenience later. And then right here, this block is, of course, initializing the background by uh, initializing the display, which every graphical pie game thing needs to do. And... This can be, you know, whatever dimensions you want and everything, of course. And then the background, in a more fully fledged game, this would be more complex. Probably not just a color, maybe. But um, I just went ahead and set it to a color. And so it's really, I probably should have named it like BG Color or something like that. But just to kind of loosely illustrate that that could be a more detailed background as well. And then I go ahead and fill that screen uh, surface with that background or that background color I should say in this situation and then I come down here and initialize some of the FPS stuff only the first half of it because I want to illustrate some of the ups and downs with it so right here I just go ahead and call up a system font because we're gonna type it on the screen so we need to do that and then uh, basically down below, I I do this because down below I'm going to need a surface. Um, right here, I actually is where I first use it, but once I do this other stuff like that's commented out right here, I'm going to already have to have a surface initialized for the very first run. So I go ahead and just initialize a, a generic surface to zero zero so it's effectively like nothing you know but it still has the methods on it and stuff you know what I might be able to comment that out let's see if I can and get away with it okay for now anyway and then I come down here this represents the main game loop and I don't use flags I notice a lot of people and a lot of uh, tutorials and stuff use like a you know wall game going flag or something I don't think that's proper so I just do the good old while true thing and then when I want to quit, I just come in here and call those two methods. But yeah, this just in case you're not super familiar with it, you come in here and you ask Pygame to get an event out of the queue and store that in the variable called event. And it does that for every event it can find in the queue. And then it comes down here and it says if that event type happens to be Pygame quit, then we want to call that stuff I was just talking about and quit. Some people, like I said, will set a flag, whatever. Okay, we're going to ignore all that junk for now. And then we come down here. Re as long as they don't quit, what it's going to do in the main game loop is it's going to uh, come here and it's going to take that font that we generated up there. 
and on that it's going to call render and it's going to get the frames per second I can't exactly remember what that stands for false so that would be on a font uh, render what would that be like a do I have to come in here it's probably not a big deal I think it's anti-aliasing actually where would that be let's give it one more shot so that'd be on the font object maybe font size da -da 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 -da. Uh, I don't I have some issues with the way some of this stuff's organized in these packages especially when half my brains probably passing right over it it's not a big deal I'm like 99% sure it's anti-aliasing so I went ahead and whatever I'm not gonna look that up right now um, I went ahead and set it to false because I'm assuming it would take a little bit more processing power to like anti-alias it and the font still looks fine to me so you can set it to true if you want anti-aliasing for some reason and then I set that font color to white and if you look up here so it was that there's that clock object also that we initialized right here create a new instance of clock so this is basically your package this is going to be the module and then buried in there is that class class constructor right and so I just named it the lowercase like popular convention um, some people might be wondering right here like what's all this junk and why didn't I wrap this in an int global function and then wrap all that in the string global function and the reason is Python especially Python 3 is very object oriented so what it does is even if I call that uh, you know int and then in parentheses like if I were to do something like this you know and then wrap that in a string and blah 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 what all that's gonna do is it's gonna call this built-in special method right here and then after that it would call this built-in special method right so I'm effectively removing one layer of indirection by doing that plus this is the more object oriented pure way to do it which I prefer to do so but mainly the main reason I'm doing it right now I think it's a little bit tacky looking especially with these dunder methods um, the the main reason is like the most slightest speed improvement okay so white font um, get an FPS as a floating point number converting that to an integer then converting that to a string so that it can get rendered and then that's going to get rendered onto that surface which initially that what it's going to do is return a surface so that little tiny surface that was a zero zero is now going to be you know so many pixels dimension and then we're going to take that surface at the upper left corner and we're going to blit it onto the screen surface so that's what blitting does is copies the pixels from one surface onto another and then we have clock tick which makes sure that since the last time clock tick was called that a certain amount of milliseconds have passed and what you pass in there in between those braces as a parameter is your uh, desired frames per second so it's going to try and keep your frames per second trending towards that number and then after that's all said and done Pygame display update will basically uh, actually display it on the screen so we're doing that in the background memory right writing all those pixels and then you probably already know all this but I just want to make sure okay so let's run it and see what happens and there's our frames per second this is the background color it was a gray that I set and of course the white for the frames per second so we have it up there but it's all blurry and stuff you may have already figured out why but um, I'll show you just in case you didn't so it's just effectively blitting itself right over the top of itself right so that's why I have this black here well before I do black what I'll do is I'll come over here well, that's one option that's the easiest one so I'll just do it so that's just an extra parameter we can pass to this uh, render method and that sets a background color so now let's run it okay so now it's nice and high contrast and everything 
But with the particular font I selected, you could probably see over here, there's a little bit of garbage left over. From my experience messing with this, if I actually select a font, like anything I can think of, that doesn't happen. But this is the system fallback font. I happen to be using Windows 8.1 for whatever that's worth. And uh, this fallback font does that. So thinking about the lowest common denominator and we should probably be prepared for that. We don't want that to happen, right? I mean, big deal. You could just forget about it and whatever, but I'm a slight perfectionist, so I don't like that kind of thing. So I'll demonstrate if I actually set a font. So if I come back up here where I um, set that FPS font, what you can do for the first parameter is pass a list of the fonts that you want. And I just passed it an empty list. You could pass it none, whatever, you know, if it doesn't find a valid font name in there, it's just going to pick something like what I just showed you, which I think is the Arial font. Don't quote me on that. Um, I know that my system has like Roboto installed, for instance. So that's the Android font. I don't know if that's still like the default Android font, but it was for a lot of years if it isn't. So I'm going to save and run that with just that one. And then there we can see the Roboto standard font, and it looks a lot nicer. No cruft on the edge or anything like that. So... We know that, but of course, if that font wasn't installed, like if I, uh, I'll pit bogus with two G's because, um, well, I don't know. I don't think I have a font named bogus one G. Okay. I'll run that. So that should be back to that default system fallback font. Yeah, it is. Cause we can see that cruft happening over there. Okay, cool. Just to kind of illustrate that. So anyway, let's go ahead and leave it at that that system fallback font, and let's worry about cleaning that up initially. So what can we do there? And what we can do is we can come over here to this erase, this thing I have right here to erase the, the frames per second counter. So I'm going to uncomment that. And what that's going to do is it's going to take that screen surface, and it's going to fill it with the background, or in this case, obviously, the background color. Uh, you want to use a different like a blitting function or something else to deal with like a I don't, it could get way more complex right if you're using anything other than a solid background color and then right here it's going to get the rectangle it's going to get the dimensions of that frames per second surface right and so that's the reason that I need this one which I'll uncomment right now I need this empty one because the very first time it drops into this loop it's going to try and call get rectangle on this object. And if I just pass it none or something like that, it's going to say, hey, none doesn't have a get rectangle method. So that's the whole point of that thing. Um, what can we do? Can we leave it at that for now? I think we can. So that's our one little improvement is we're going to erase the portion of the screen that had that effectively. So it should get rid of that little cruft on the edge, even with the ugly font. So there it is. With the ugly font, no cruft, you can see it erasing there. All right. So now I'm going to hop back over here. What else do we have going on? So that's going kind of quick, right? And like right here, I have it set at 120, just to kind of illustrate like a middle of the road number. More realistically, something like 60 is what we're going to do. And in the case of 60 with nothing go nothing else going on, it stays pretty close, 59, 60 frames per second. It's fairly readable, but like I demonstrated with that 120, if it's bouncing all over the place, maybe it looks a little bit, when, how would we like it if like every, you know, fraction of a specific fraction of a second, we were like displaying it instead of just letting it kind of like jump around sort of randomly or whatever. So just in case you're interested in that, I wanted to demonstrate how to do that. And here I'll do it at 1,000. So anything over 1,000 is basically uncapped. It's like the same thing as zero or not passing a value. Um, so I'll do that. That's the fastest one. So there you can see it's just jamming, right? We can't even read it. If your frames per second are going that fast, you probably don't have too much of an issue. But anyway... So if we put it at 1,000, it actually will do some capping. If 
but it looks the same because of the video. I think my video recording slowing it down, but usually if it's over a thousand on mine, it will be like 1000. There's like a few like fixed values it lands on most of the time. It's like 1250, 1000, something else like that. Anyway, you get the picture, I think. So what we'll do is how can we slow it down to where like, say we want to use the, something really fast like that. We want to see how many frames per second, if we're getting like hundreds of frames per second for some reason, we want to still be able to see it. So that's where this last portion that I have commented comes into play. So I'll uncomment that. And what I'm doing here is I'm creating an event. And this just creates this is a user event, right? Just like this Pi Game Quit event that gets dropped in the queue if I click the X on the window. Um, this event will get dropped in the queue based on a timer. Where did I set that? Did I already set the timer up? Oh, it's right below it. <laughs> okay, so right here, the timer is, um, I don't know, it's kind of weird the way it is to wrap your head around both these at once. It's not a big deal, but just sort of like, one depends on the other, so whatever. So what I'm doing is I'm taking this FPS event and I'm passing that in right here so you can see I snuck in a little um, constructor right there. So I do this to, this basically, this custom type method on the event module will, uh, I guess, it's a, it's really more like a function if I'm talking about it in a module, but it's a lot like a method on a singleton, right? So anyway, um, that's going to just basically go into its little pool of values and it's going to grab a number that's available and assign it to that FPS event constant that I've made there. So whatever number that happens to be, it doesn't matter. It's abstracted away behind a readable variable and that's all we care about, right? And then it's going to take that value, 23 or whatever you want to think it might be, and it's going to Gen it's going to encapsulate that inside of an event object and which has potentially like other values with it but you could see i just pass it for the second parameter i just pass it an empty an empty dictionary right there because i don't care about anything all i care about is if this special number comes through i it doesn't need any extra fluff on it and this 256 is just that's just a number i made up that's how many milliseconds between updates. So you might want to fine tune that if you want it quicker or slower, you know, maybe you want it 500 milliseconds to slow it down, whatever. Um, and then what it's doing here is it's setting a timer. So when it, it generates, generates a number, then creates an event with that number, then it sets a timer at every 256 milliseconds. So roughly every quarter of a second it's going to update i just picked 256 because it's uh i think it's divisible by 16 even so it's a power of two so it will uh theoretically it might run slightly faster than some other numbers it might be a little more efficient to deal with so when we come in here now we're going to check for that event type so it's going to check if they quit no if they didn't want to quit then we're going to check is it an fps event I almost think for optimization, I would probably do this one first and put this quit last. But anyway, it's just easier to illustrate it by doing it like this. Okay, and then I'm going to just take all of this code to do with blitting it. And I'm just going to scoot it over so that it's under that event like that. So now this code will only run if that event's true, right? Otherwise, it will just skip it and, you know still try and adhere to the frames per second and update itself. So whatever other regular game stuff was going on would happen. So it's going to come in, erase that background, generate the text, and then it's going to blit that text onto that little surface. And, or it, it creates a little surface and then it blits that surface onto the screen. Okay, let's check it out now. And we're still at a thousand frames per second, so that's it's still going to be switching values really fast behind the screen. But once roughly every quarter of a second, like I said, then and only then will it actually render it on the screen, that text about it. So there it is. Now we can actually see those values. 700, 500, whatever. 
Okay, what else do should I cover here? That's pretty much it. Um, I'll post this code on GitHub and I'll put a link to it under the video on YouTube. And there, I wanted to show you what it looks like if we. Hmm, what was other? Let me give me one second if I can remember what there was to it. Oh yeah, the reason I recommend the frames per second with that black background is because you never know what your background is going to be, right? Like if it, I mean, you do know sometimes, but if you have a really dynamic game, it could change and it could get difficult to read. So one of the general, most general rules of thumb for like basic design is if you change the foreground or background color of some, especially text, then you want to do the control the opposite, you know? So if you change the text color, you want to set the background color as well, or vice versa, right? If you set the background color, you want to make sure that you're aware of what the text color could be. That way they don't end up in a bad contrast kind of a situation. I guess I could try and demonstrate that real quick. So if we come up here and set that background color to, uh, this should be like, like a bright kind of neon green thing. And then I'll get rid of this black part again and just cap it off right there. And let's see if that works. Okay, yeah, that, I think that's a pretty reasonable illustration right there. You could still read it, but it's difficult, right? It's not, not ideal. If you don't care, you don't care. So that's the reason that I go ahead and add that value, add that last parameter in there to do that. So, so let's put this back down at like 60 and let's put this back at a reasonable value and let's run it one last time. Give one last gander at it. So there it is. That's how you do frames per second in Pygame. Thanks for watching.